So hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our audience. This is Vivek Bhandari from Scholarly, welcoming all of you to this session of uh, Introduction to College Level Research in Physics with Professor Doros Pedesis. By the way of background, uh, Scholarly and Allegheny College have been conducting credit courses and research programs for the last few years. And in fact, Professor Pedesis has been one of the first professors uh, who started conducting the program. So this has been, he has conducted these classes, uh, I think four times now, multiple times with number of mm -hmm. different students. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a moment, he's going to talk about uh, what students cover in these classes, his own area of research, and also how does it benefit students and how does it benefit their learning? Uh, what we'll do is I'm going to turn it over to Professor Pedesis in a moment. And after we have covered his presentation, we'll open it up to for any questions. If there are questions, please keep on submitting them to the chat or to the Q&A on this webinar. And we'll try to address them uh, either along the presentation or towards the end. And yes, we are recording this session. So a copy of this webinar will be available later on on our YouTube channel. So with that, a very warm welcome to Professor Doros Pedesis. Professor Pedesis, pleasure to have you here. And I'll turn it over to you for your introduction and presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Vivek. And uh, it is my pleasure to be here. Um, as Vivek already um, uh, mentioned, I have done this many times uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, get to know uh, students from different countries and introduce them to the way we do um, research uh, here in the United States and, uh, and how we uh, introduce our students to the particular type of uh, work that we do. And um, so um, I thought that um, I should uh, first um, give you uh, a little bit of background about myself since um, I was once a foreign student here myself. I came uh, from uh, another country like many of you who are interested in coming to the United States uh, on this uh, webinar. And um, just um, uh, briefly about my origins, um, I was born and raised in Cyprus, which is a tiny little island um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and um, I came to the United States um, in 1981 to study physics. And I had many options at that time, more than 40 years ago. Um, I had options to um, either go to Greece or the United Kingdom. Um, I had uh, been accepted to universities in both countries. And, but I decided to come to the United States because um, the United States simply has the best colleges and universities uh, in the world, and especially in the, uh, in the sciences. So for me, it was not a question of, uh, of, of choice at that time, because I knew that the United States had to be my destination, because I wanted to be a scientist, and I knew the best uh, place to be uh, for that was the United States. So, um, so I will tell you a little bit about my academic journey, so that I, um, I will, uh, that will serve um, as a as a bit of an introduction to um, academia in the United States uh, for many of you. I'm sure you know, um, you know a lot about, um, about the academic um, environment in the United States uh, through all of the, or through many websites uh, and uh, things that I, were not available to me uh, more than 40 years ago. But, uh, but it's, all, it's a good idea to get some personal perspective since uh, I, was, um, I was in your shoes uh, more than four decades ago. And uh, coming here was, uh, was uh, quite an eye-opening experience and, um, and seeing a, a different type of environment, uh, both the physical environment and the, uh, the social environment and, and also the academic environment. So I started my academic journey at a very large university um, at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, this is one of the so-called Big Ten universities, and uh, these are 10 of the largest universities in the United States. And I think just the Bloomington campus alone uh, has 45,000 students, something like that. Uh, but uh, there's a system of campuses throughout the state of Indiana. And, and the one in the university in Bloomington is the, um, is the flagship uh, institution of the whole, uh, of the whole system. Uh, I think there is at least um, 
six campuses uh, spread out all over the uh, all over um, uh, the state of Indiana. So Bloomington is uh, it's a it's a small city. It's a it's called a university city because it, it uh, exists almost entirely because of the big university there, and it's uh, it's about thirty miles south of Indianapolis, which is a big city. But the small city, the small town environment is is very conducive to um, uh, to academic life uh, and uh, and staying away from uh, all of the distractions that a big city uh, can offer. But uh, so the the small town is, uh, is is it's a it's a nice environment. But also the university itself offers everything that you could possibly um, need from uh, from cafeterias to um, movie theaters, uh, bookstores, everything you could possibly imagine is, is on campus, which is, is a huge campus. Um, so I came to Indiana University to um, study physics um, for my bachelor's degree. And one of the nice things about um, American universities is that you have opportunities to do research, uh, even as an undergraduate. Um, and in, um, in my uh, in, in my current uh, college, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, uh, there are students who um, even start doing research right after their freshman year. So, um, so you can uh, get engaged into real research with real scientists uh, early on. And I had that opportunity at Indiana University, which um, had a, a big research um, institute there um, doing research in nuclear physics uh, called the Cyclotron Facility. And uh, one thing about big universities is that they have enormous resources. Uh, so they, their facilities are, are first rate. They're, 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 um, uh, they're top, of, um, top facilities that you could find anywhere in the world. And, uh, and they, um, they can offer in the sciences, they, can, uh, they, they do spend a lot of money to um, you know, create these enormous facilities where you can do research um, and, and focus on research without worrying about uh, who's funding it and who's providing the money and all that. So the cyclotron facility allowed me to um, enter research as an undergraduate. Uh, when I was still in my, in my third year, I started doing research there and that continues um, even after graduation when I stayed on for a couple more years to um, uh, do research uh, in, uh, into nuclear physics. After that, I moved to, uh, to a different type of university. Uh, this was um, uh, more of a medium-sized university with about um, 16,000 students. Uh, and this was Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Uh, and this uh, was also different in the sense that it's, uh, it's an urban university. Uh, so it's in the middle of a city, but as you can see from this uh, picture here, it's surrounded by parkland, and it's a very um, it's a very attractive environment. The uh, the campus and its uh, and its an environs. So um, so smaller school, but uh, more focused into the sciences and engineering. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Uh, it's uh, has an enormous reputation in robotics, and. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was that reason that made me choose uh, Carnegie Mellon University because I knew of its um, stature in the, in the sciences and engineering. Uh, so I wanted to continue my, my studies for a master's degree and eventually a PhD degree. And um, so, uh, so this university, it's interesting because not only produces some of the best scientists and engineers um, in the United States, uh, but also it has one of the top rated business schools uh, in the country. So uh, it's extremely difficult to get into uh, from what I hear. Uh, but also another distinction this university has, which is, is unique to American uh, universities, it has produced uh, its drama and acting department has produced a lot of uh, famous um, actors here in the United States. So, so uh, it's, uh, it's incredible that a school that is known for engineering and science uh, also uh, produces a lot of business leaders and, uh, and a lot of entertainment uh, leaders. Uh, but that's again, uh, one of the beauties of the um, American higher education system. Uh, so at Carnegie Mellon, I, I, I focused, I narrowed my research, I switched the, um, the focus of my research from nuclear physics to 
uh, solid state physics because I found that area much more fascinating. And I focused on low temperature physics and magnetism. So my, I did research, um, I did uh, spectroscopy research uh, at very low temperatures uh, close to absolute zero, which is about, uh, about 300 degrees below room temperature. So it's, uh, it's the point, the absolute zero, where um, a lot of the um, motions of uh, molecular motions and things like that stop. So we go to those low, low temperatures to study the behavior of matter and, and also to um, uh, study the interactions that are happening within atoms. Uh, so, um, so I did all of that and I continue to do that uh, in my uh, current uh, position uh, as well. So um, after my PhD, I stayed um, at Carnegie Mellon University, but I moved to a different department to um, do postdoctoral work. And that is typical in the sciences and engineering where um, the PhD is not enough, you have to do some postdoctoral work. And typically postdoctoral work um, uh, varies in duration between one to three years. And, uh, and I did my three years in the Department of Chemistry. And then after that, I stayed there for another uh, almost two years as a research scientist. Uh, so there, are the, I focus. I shifted the focus from solid state physics to more uh, biological uh, um, type of research, and I worked in a big uh, lab. Again, the uh, the resources of the university were incredible, and um, I worked at Mellon Institute, which is shown here in this picture. Uh, this massive, massive uh, building housing thousands of um, of uh, scientists. And I worked in a big lab along with other physicists, chemists, and biologists because um, nowadays a lot of the um, scientific problems are incredibly complex, and they require talent from uh, from uh, very different uh, disciplines. So um, in this lab that I worked in, uh, I we looked at biological systems and we look uh, we use different approaches to uh, study those systems using physical approaches, chemical and biological approaches to fully understand what they were doing, what the systems are doing. So, um, so uh, my, uh, my advice to you uh, is that uh, a broad scientific base is a good requirement for any scientist or engineer today. So uh, make sure that you broaden your scientific base once you go to university, once you come to the United States so that you will be better suited to do um, high level research um, at some point. So um, as a postdoctoral uh, fellow, I, I worked in this um, big lab as I, as I mentioned. And one of the things that I did uh, was um, I, de I designed and, um, and um, built um, a brand new uh, type of instrument uh, that is shown here in this picture. Uh, this is um, a spectrometer that uh, looks at the, um, at the electrons inside atoms. And we can look at what these um, electrons are doing inside the atom and how they're influenced by other atoms around them and how they interact with other electrons. And this, um, to do this type of research, and I'll talk more about this um, in a few minutes because this is the type of research that I focus on with, uh, with the students in these courses that we offer. Uh, we require large magnetic fields. So we require a, a large magnet here. And also we need to do these things at low temperatures. So we uh, need cryostats to take the, our uh, samples down to extremely low temperatures, clo uh, close to absolute zero. And the, um, the instrumentation is fairly elaborate here. So I was privileged to um, have that opportunity to have the resources to design and build the spectrometer, which to this day, I, I keep enhancing through my collaborations with that same lab, which is only um, about 90 miles uh, south of where I am now. But I continue to and I continue to work on this uh, instrument and enhance it. In fact, some of my students who uh, do research with me, uh, American students uh, who are present at the college, they spend summers there and do research in this big lab and they continue to work on this uh, with the spectrometer. Okay, after my postdoctoral work and my, uh, 
my couple of years as a research scientist um, in chemistry, I came to Allegheny College, which is um, in Northwestern Pennsylvania, in, um, in an area that is known uh, as the snow belt because we're close to the, uh, we're right at the uh, big lake, uh, the Great Lakes, and we get a lot of, um, a lot of snow. <clears throat> and, um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, this is um, a different type of institution. Um, and um, I'm sure you know about liberal arts colleges in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and liberal arts colleges, they're essentially small universities. And most of the colleges um, only offer uh, bachelor's degrees. So they do not offer master's or uh, PhD degrees. So the emphasis is on undergraduate teaching. So uh, most of our um, um, time here is spent on teaching. And um, so about 70% of our time is spent on teaching and 30% of our time on research. So our emphasis are the students and student learning. So uh, because, of the, um, because the college is small, there's only a couple of thousand students enrolled. So our classes are very small. Um, so I very often teach advanced courses in physics with six students in them. So, um, so I have a lot of time to get to know all of the students, um, understand how they're learning and all that and, and help them um, learn uh, the, um, the more advanced material. So, so this is the beauty of, this, uh, of the small liberal arts colleges that we offer these small classes and this more individualized attention uh, to students. So um, I teach um, a lot of introductory physics courses here, um, essentially courses on uh, mechanics, classical mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, uh, electricity, magnetism, optics. Um, I also teach courses in introductory quantum mechanics, uh, advanced courses in biophysics, uh, in magnetic materials and spectroscopy. And my research uh, is focused on magnetic materials and also biological systems. So, um, so the kind of research I do here, you can see part of my research lab uh, here. Again, I use some um, instrumentation to, um, to study the, um, the electrons inside atoms. And uh, this could be inside solid state systems, uh, biological systems or synthetic systems like the one that is shown here. This is a, a, system, this is a molecule that was um, designed and, and made at uh, Texas A&M University. So I have a collaboration with um, uh, researchers at Texas A&M University and also at Carnegie Mellon University, of course, where we all collaborate together to understand complex systems like this one. And this uh, synthetic molecule here um, has the function that um, it's, uh, it's a molecule that it can act as a molecular switch, which means that under certain conditions, it can, uh, it can uh, turn uh, processes on or off uh, at the molecular level. So it has some potential uh, applications, uh, technological applications, and that's why we um, we, we study the system. And we use this technique that's called electron spin resonance uh, spectroscopy. And, and this is um, the, the technique that I discussed, uh, that I talked about earlier, where uh, a magnet is, um, is, um, is needed. And we use microwave radiation that is produced by the instrument itself to interact with the electrons inside the atoms. And we also um, use um, the cryostat, which is not easily um, seen here. Uh, it's a cryostat that it's uh, inside the magnet in here, uh, where it takes the, the temperature down to uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures, which um, it's close to about 200 um, degrees below zero. Um, and there is elaborate instrumentation here that is needed to uh, do this, uh, this work. And also in my lab, we, we do a lot of chemical synthesis as well. So we, we make a lot of the samples that we, we use as well. Some of the simpler molecules that, um, that this molecule here is extremely difficult to make. That's why the resources of a bigger, a bigger university are needed. And that's my collaboration with uh, Texas A&M University. 
Okay, so this is, uh, this is again, uh, another part of my lab and instrumentation that I use. Uh, so um, the instrumentation is quite elaborate and we use uh, multiple instruments uh, to do different types of research. So this is another spectrometer here in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a lab next door. And this is an older spectrometer that um, I use for teaching purposes. And, and this is the spectrometer that we use for the um, for classes uh, in this program. And it is a research grade uh, spectrometer. It's a little bit older. Uh, so uh, it's not as, um, as suited to studying uh, complicated molecules like the, the one that I already mentioned, uh, but simpler molecules like the ones we studied in this class, this is perfectly suited for that. And it also has um, a smaller magnet and a cryostat here that again can take, um, uses liquid nitrogen that takes the temperature of our samples to again about 200 uh, degrees below zero uh, so that we can uh, do the uh, studies. Okay, so the course that I teach in this program is called LS190. It's an introduction to college research in physics. So, um, so the, um, the outcomes of this course is to uh, learn how academic research in physics is carried out. So I explain to students how we do research in physics, how we pose the questions, how we, how we look at the problems, how we analyze the problems, how we do the experiments, collect data, uh, analyze the data and draw conclusions from that. And uh, the topic that I focus my um, class on is magnetism, which is my area of research. And, uh, and magnetism is of course, one of the largest areas of study. And, or, and it, um, it spreads over a lot of disciplines uh, from physics, material science, electrical and computer engineering and so on. So it's a huge um, area and uh, with tremendous applications. Um, so magnetism is just not, it's not just the little magnets that we, we play with as kids or, or we stick on our refrigerators, uh, but um, magnetism is responsible for, um, uh, for data storage on computers. So all of the computers that we use like uh, laptops or desktop compu computers, they all, um, they all uh, utilize hard drives and hard drives um, uh, use uh, um, magnetic storage to store information and retrieve information. So, so that's one of the um, applications of magnetism that permeates our modern lives and um, computers wouldn't be possible without magnetism. So uh, students, um, they learn how to um, do library research and they will have access to the resources of, of a large library like our own. And our library here um, has uh, subscribes to a lot of um, scientific databases. So we have access uh, to pretty much anything that is published in the sciences and engineering. So uh, through the library, um, the students will be able with their um, Allegheny um, uh, email address, they'll be able to log on to the library to do the research that I will require them to do um, to, uh, for, um, for their papers and for, for their work. So, so we can, um, we learn how to do that, how to use the library and how to access all these papers and, and how to read them and can get the information that we need. Okay, so, so also in this class, in order to be able to understand the research and, and, and then analyze data and all that, we, we have to learn the basics of magnetism. And that goes beyond what, uh, what most people learn in high school. And uh, so we, there will be uh, a few lectures in the beginning just to understand uh, this, this complicated topic. And um, just to give you an idea of what we um, need to do is to un, uh, zero in and understand what the electron does because that's the origin of magnetism, okay? So it is the, um, uh, the electron only uh, is responsible for generating current and electricity and all that, but also um, is responsible for magnetism. And in order to um, understand what the electron does, we have to learn a little bit of quantum mechanics. So we will do a couple of lectures to get into quantum mechanics and understand 
especially how the hydrogen atom works, okay? So for the, this is a simplified diagram that uh, we, um, that we uh, represents the hydrogen atom and it shows the, uh, the electron um, moving about the proton. And, uh, and the electron has, uh, possesses properties like orbital angular momentum and um, L and spin angular momentum, which both give rise to magnetism. So this is what we need to understand, to understand the basic quantums of the hydrogen atom. And this is something like uh, in, in courses here at Allegheny, we spend a whole semester, three full months of three courses per week, uh, three classes per week to just understand the hydrogen atom. So in this course, we're gonna do it in a couple of classes. So, so it will all be condensed, but uh, we'll, we'll get the necessary um, properties of the hydrogen atom that will help us later on to understand the research. Okay, so, and in this particular technique that I use uh, electron spin resonance, we exploit the spin properties of the, um, of the electron that the electron inside a magnetic field can have either a spin up or spin down. And we can uh, separate the energies of these two, um, two, two spin states and use microwave radiation to induce transitions between these energy states. So we can move the electron from a low energy to a high energy. And when the electron does that, it absorbs energy. And that's what we look at. We look at the energy that is absorbed by the electron. And that gives us a lot of uh, information about the properties of the electron, just by looking at the, at the absorption of microwave energy, okay? So this is essentially our signal that we, we get and, and we can, that can give us, it's loaded with a lot of information about what the atom is doing, what the electron is doing inside the atom and how it also interacts with other atoms inside the molecule. So we will focus on four areas of magnetism. So we'll use this, uh, this, um, uh, this uh, ESR technique to, um, to look at different uh, areas here. And, uh, and the students, uh, typically I have my students uh, research each one of these um, areas based on, on what they like. So they choose what area to research and, and do a presentation on that. So <clears throat> there is um, the area of magnetic storage um, that I mentioned already, um, how we store uh, information on hard drives in, in computers and all that. So uh, students learn how that is done and they learn about um, what the different types of, um, of uh, ways that we can um, store information. Uh, we talk about, uh, we learn about molecular magnets and nanoparticles. That's an area of research in my lab. This is that molecule that I showed you before. And, and these are crystals that we produced in my lab uh, to study. Uh, we also um, look at superconductivity, which is uh, it's a big area of research nowadays. Uh, people are trying to understand how high temperature superconductivity works and how we can find applications uh, for that. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and also in the biological realm, we um, look at metalloproteins. And this is some um, systems that I study in my own research as well. And uh, metalloproteins um, are big proteins that uh, contain metal ions uh, in them. And the um, and so an example is hemoglobin and, and myoglobin that we all contain a lot of that to transport and store um, oxygen. So we can study these proteins using uh, ESR. And um, I have here one of the proteins that we studied uh, a lot in my lab. Um, this is a cytochrome. Uh, which um, in, inside biological systems, it allows the transfer of electrons from one place to the other, okay? And it's shown here how the electrons uh, move through this um, arrow here. So we, we will study systems like this. Uh, the students will have the opportunity to do that and, um, and do presentations, learn how to do scientific presentations, okay? So they, uh, during the, this course, they will uh, get a more in-depth knowledge of these uh, of these four areas, and they will learn how to prepare the professional PowerPoint pro presentations, uh, which will be at the level that they can be presented a professional um, at at the at the university level, of course, in the classroom, 
or at meetings or at professional meetings as well. So, um, so we I will uh, teach the students how to do all of that, how to create those professional um, presentations. Another thing that is unique to this course and, um, and that I do um, is that I take the students into the lab with me remotely though, okay? So uh, since we're all in different countries, um, I bring the students in, I, I created the, um, the uh, I put cameras inside my, uh, my lab at various points and all that. And with the students, uh, can uh, log on and come in into the lab with me and observe how I set up the experiments, how I prepare the instrument, how I set up the experiments, how I carry out re, uh, the uh, data collection. And they're there every step of the way. So they see how everything is done. And you can see here, this is a, this is a shot of, the, um, of, the, of the, my computer screen. And you can see at the bottom, I, I blanked out the names, of course, for uh, privacy policies, but you can see here all of the uh, images of the students who are present in the class. So um, there is many more, of course. Uh, I think at that, at that time, there were about 12 or 14 students uh, participating. So they're there and they see how they uh, observe how I, I get the instrument ready, how I tune the instrument, um, how I get it ready to collect data how I prepare the sample and how I collect the data. And, and the data looks like this. So this is one of the samples that we, we collected together last summer. And uh, this is manganese chloride inside, um, inside water. And, and the manganese chloride has this interesting uh, structure called hyperfine structure. And that's um, indicative of uh, interactions between the electron and the nucleus, uh, the electron, an electron in the manganese uh, atom and its own nucleus. So we can detect the interaction between the electron and the nucleus through this um, signal here that we get uh, in, from our spectrometer. And uh, this is, um, as, uh, as you can see here, I circled this. This was done at 104 Kelvin, which is about minus 170, 180 degrees centigrade. So we had to cool the instrument to very low temperatures in order to be able to see the signal. And there is reasons for that. And the students learn all about those reasons, why we have to go to very low temperatures to observe this signal. This signal, we would never be able to observe it at room temperature, for example. And that's one of the things that students learn in this class, why we need to go to those low temperatures. Another example uh, that we, uh, we started this, um, this summer is the celestite crystal. And this is a project that I have with, um, with a research institute where we try to understand how these natural uh, precious gems that are collected from different parts of the world. Like I think this crystal came from Russia uh, and, and we, we want to understand what, uh, what um, determines their properties uh, by the environmental conditions that we were exposed in and all, and all, and all that. So we took a crystal like this and we studied it. We, we put it on a, this is the crystal of celestite here. What this is what the molecular structure looks like. We put it on, on, a, on, on, on supports that allow us to rotate these crystals and see that the, the signals that we get depend on the orientation of the crystal. And this is something that the students are also learn about. They learn why that is possible. Why, what determines this differences in the signal that we get depending on, on how we orient the crystal inside the magnetic field. Okay, so there, there this is a picture of the lab taken while I was, uh, I was getting uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, the liquid nitrogen comes in these big canisters here and we have to transfer it using this special transfer line into a smaller container so that we can get it into the instrument so the uh, students see how that all of that is done. And, and here's, um, here's the um, part of the instrument with the, you can see here, there is frost that is formed there because the instrument got cold. And this is a, a liquid sample that I was um, freezing inside liquid nitrogen. So you can see the sample here inside the tube and you can see that it's starting to freeze down here. So the students see how that is done. So they learn how we freeze those samples because they have to, we have to use a, a certain process to uh, freeze the samples properly. And then the sample 
you can see the, the sample tube is right here. It goes inside the, inside the instrument here so that we can get the signal and so on. So this is um, this is the temperature controller here. So the students learn how this operates and how uh, how it works. And you see that at this particular point when I took the uh, this picture, the temperature was at minus 170 degrees centigrade. So the students learn how we do that, how we can lower the temperature of the sample. Uh, this is a frequency counter here that determines the tells us what the frequency of the radiation is. And down here is the electronics console and the students learn how that console is properly tuned to amplify our signal because our signal is extremely weak and we need to amplify it in order to see. So we learn all about the details of the electronic instrumentation here that is required for us to amplify the, uh, the signal so that we can collect the signal. So you can see this is the manganese chloride signal I was um, showing you earlier and this is how we collect it in real time. So there are multiple cameras everywhere that allow the students to monitor everything, the collection of the, of, of the data, the, the various in instruments and the cryostat and all that, they, they, the students can uh, monitor all of that at the same time. Okay, so this is, um, I wanted to show you uh, examples of presentations of, um, of students. So these are, the, these are the front pages of all of some of the presentations from last summer uh, to show you that uh, the students, I, I blanked out the names, of course, uh, for privacy reasons, but you can see uh, this student here did their uh, presentation on metalloproteins, uh, one on uh, superconductivity, uh, magnetic nanoparticles, magnetic storage, another one, metalloproteins. So you see, yes, this was done summer of um, 2021, last summer. Um, so all of these uh, presentations, and this is just a subset um, of the of the presentations. Um, like I said, there were many more students in the class. And this is an example of one of the presentations that are, um, so uh, I put some of the slides that are possible there about, shows you the uh, the cover slide, the uh, the leading questions, you know, that the students uh, posed and they answer those questions in the process of the presentation. And they, um, they you see here that they uh, explain motivated their study by explaining what superconductivity is, why um, superconductivity is important. And here's some of the background research, background, I'm sorry, theory that is, uh, that is needed, okay? So, um, so this is one of the examples. And these are the papers at the end of the course, after we uh, collect, uh, did the experiments, uh, we, and we collected a lot of data. The students had to analyze the, uh, the data and they had to write a professional um, type paper. Uh, so, and again, under my guidance, I showed them how that is possible and I helped them uh, with the writing of the paper. And these are the title pages of, um, of a couple of the papers uh, shows, you know, how you properly write it with a title, um, create an abstract, we learn how to create an abstract and how to structure the, uh, the paper itself. So this is a couple of other um, cover pages of the, of the paper. So typically these papers are about a, a dozen pages long and, uh, and they again include everything that is required of a paper, like the abstract, an introduction, motivation, a background theory, a section on instrumentation, a section on the data on the experimental conditions and experimental uh, data collection analysis and so on. And um, so the students are graded on this and they and I give them a lot of feedback. I, uh, I, each paper, I give them a, a tremendous amount of feedback to help them improve their papers in the future. And a couple of papers have already been accepted by, uh, I seem to recall one student whose paper got accepted by, uh, uh, by something that is, uh, some organization that is related with CERN in Switzerland and they, they publish their paper there. So, um, so it is possible to, um, to do publications as well, okay? So uh, this is it, I'm, I'm sorry it took me so long, but I wanted to give you as much information as possible. Um, please, I'm, I'm here for, to answer some questions. Professor, first of all, thanks a lot. Uh, this was an excellent presentation.
And I think uh, reflecting at it uh, in the last couple of years, we have come a long way with a large mm -hmm. number of students, especially in the physics program. I think this is one of the oldest programs that uh, we started with. And mm -hmm. uh, you've been associated with the program from the very beginning, from 2020. And mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the most anticipated presentations. Uh, every time uh, we have conducted this presentation with you, there are a lot of questions. Audience uh, really loves uh, uh, looking into your background as well as the pictures of your lab and the way the research is conducted. Thank so you. I think, uh, so let me first answer the couple of housekeeping questions that have come in, maybe I can take those. And after that, I can hand over there some specific questions, which I can probably uh, ask you to help with. Uh, so maybe if you can stop sharing your screen, uh, Professor Pettis. Uh, Okay, thank you. So uh, there are some questions about the summer 22 schedule. So let me answer some uh, standard general questions first, and then we'll go into specific questions for uh, Professor Pettis. So the registrations for the summer 22 are now open. You can go to Scholarly's website and uh, register for the courses. And you can take one course, any one course in one field that you want. So there are two slots. Slot one is on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Slot two is on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The physics course, classical physics, that's in slot two. So for those of you who are interested in uh, physics, basically magnetism, classical physics, EPR spectroscopy, and with all the applications that Professor Pettis spoke about, you can go to our website and you can apply there for the classical physics research. So the classes will be conducted from the 21st June to the 9th of August. So uh, that falls right uh, in, in between the summer break for most of the students. So I think that's a very convenient time. And for those of you who have just completed class 10th or who are currently in class uh, 10th, uh, who will be completing class 10th uh, in a few weeks or a few months, those of you who are in class 11th, this is a great time to work on research papers and create your profile. Uh, I saw a number of questions and uh, I let Professor Pettis talk about those, how he conducts, uh, how he helps the students, how do students uh, select the research topics. One resource that I would like to point out to you is if you go to Scholarly's website and look at the published papers, you will see a number of papers in different subjects, including physics. So, for example, there are papers in economics, there are papers in physics. In fact, Dhruv Sadani was. Uh, I think uh, we, we, so scholarly also organizes contests and events to identify the students that uh, did the best work. It's a combination of the feedback they get from the professor along with the presentation that they make. Uh, so we recognize the top students. So Dhruv was one of the students from last year and uh, he's a computer science student and he worked under Professor Pettis and his field was biochemical samples using EPR spectroscopy. Uh, those of you who want to know more, you're welcome to watch the video which is present on the site or download the paper. Uh, likewise, uh, you will find multiple different papers uh, in physics as well as in other subjects that we work on with Allegheny College on the site. So I'm going to pause here and I'm going to come back to the questions that the audience had asked. Okay, I see there, is, there are a lot of questions here. I hope some of them were um, answered um, during the course of my presentation. Um, yeah, how can a high school student write a research paper in physics? Well, that's a whole purpose of this course to learn how to do that. Uh, and um, so, and, and, and hopefully um, uh, students uh, take to heart all of these uh, things that they learn here and also, as I mentioned, I, we, um, when they write their paper under my guidance, I also give them a lot of feedback after I read it uh, so that they can improve the papers in the future. Um, it's a question here, someone who's interested in quantum computing. And uh, yes, you're, th this is the right place for that. Uh, we will not specifically talk about quantum computing, but we'll understand the principles of that. 
especially when we discuss how uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, work and 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 what the electrons do inside nanoparticles. So, so yes, it will, won't be discussion of quantum computing per se, but we'll uh, lay down the foundation for understanding that. Uh, another question, how should I start my research without having any kind of instrument? I hope I answered that. Uh, you will not have access to the instrument, but you will be able to see how everything is done. So as I, as I mentioned, the, you know, we, um, the students come into the lab with me virtually, of course, and, uh, and through the various cameras that we have there and the interaction with me, I, I show them every step of the way, how the instrument operates, how, um, and how we uh, set it up, how we collect data and everything. And I also give students a lot of um, resources. I give them a lot of handouts on how these how these instruments work, and and these are handouts that I prepared myself, and uh, so that they can follow, they can see the instructions. And in fact, what I do, I send them out the the uh, a couple of handouts before we start the experiment, so they can uh, with all the instructions on how the instrument gets set up and operates and all that, so that they can follow the setup while they're at the same time they they can see me doing all of that so they have the handouts in front of them while they also see me uh, preparing everything and, and getting the instrument ready so they can uh, at least even without direct access to the instrument i guess they until i um at least they get an idea of, of how this this kind of instrumentation gets set up how will we uh come up with uh, uh research questions again this is the purpose of this course to help you get to the point where you can ask those questions. Okay. And uh, uh, do they have to be linked to magnetism or can be the interdisciplinary? I believe magnetism is extremely interdisciplinary as I showed you already from biological systems to solid state systems to superconductivity, um, nanoparticles and all that. So it will have to be within the umbrella of magnetism, which is quite broad. Uh, the research, but you know, but it, it you know it intersects with so many different other areas. Will we get exposure to equipment or instruments for the research question? Yes, you again virtually you will see all of that. What is the schedule for the entire duration? I think Vivek mentioned that it will be from late June to early August, and we will have Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes. Am I right, uh, Vivek? Um, I think professor of physics it's Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh, I'm sorry, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I'm sorry about that. Yes, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we have six weeks of classes, and 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 so so it will be. It's that, that that's just enough to learn the basics of this research. Uh, okay. Um, we. Um, Um, okay, will all the students be doing research in the same topic uh, for the uh, purpose of the presentations? It will not be uh, on the same. The students are free to choose between these various topics that I will um, assign, like magnetic storage, superconductivity, metalloproteins, and so uh, and, uh, and and so on. Will there be individual session with the student? Yes, there will be. Uh, where I, I get together with a student and the student does a presentation, the pre their presentation, and I give them feedback on their presentation as well. So the students get feedback, not only on, on the paper, the final paper, but they get feedback from me on their presentation as well. So I will be there to listen to their presentation and then give them all of the feedback to improve their presentation so that they get at the uh, level of professional presentations as well. Um, so uh, let's explain the publication process. So I guess uh, Scholarly publish, uh, publishes these, some of these papers uh, on, on their website. Um, the rest, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's up to the student and I, I would be happy to um, help them in publicizing the, uh, publishing their uh, research in certain uh, forums. Um, this is not the kind of research that will be published in physical review, for example, or the Journal of the American Physical Society or whatever, but it can find its way into um, other venues uh, that don't have to be at the very top of the research. Okay, what does the research, okay. If I may add here, I think there, are, there is a general stream of questions which I think uh, it's important to clarify here. 
so uh, a number of students uh, i mean especially when you're taking research one of the most important things is also to understand what is the time available to you and what is it that you're trying to accomplish in that time because as a high school student the expectation of research from you is different compared to what uh, will be a research expectation from you as a final year undergraduate student or as a research scholar who is pursuing their phd and keep in mind you have a period of time you have a period of 2 months in which you have to define a suitable topic you will have some access to the lab where professor petersis will show you some of the equipment help you with some of the readings etc but still a lot of your research is going to be a significant part of your research will be secondary research now since you enrolled at allegheny college you will have access to college library you will have access to other college resources but one of the most important things here is to define your research question and your research topic uh, well now many of you might have read uh, the hitchhiker's guide to galaxy where there is a big supercomputer which is uh, calculating the answer to life its meaning and basically the ultimate question and after years i think 7 million years of computation it comes up with the answer of 42 so you don't want to end up with the answer of 42 you want to define what you want to do very clearly you want to want to get a sense of how to write the right question and then once you have that right question once you have come up with some hypothesis of how to answer it if the topic interests you that will be something you can continue to pursue in your college studies later on when you are at college so uh, one important thing is be realistic about what you can do in 6 weeks uh, go after a good problem go after an interesting problem do your homework do your studies do your own uh, spend your own time uh, get feedback from professor petersis and try to come up with a framework which you can use in future but this this may not be the place where you will complete your phd uh, research during the summer exactly yes uh, that's that's excellent excellently put and um it's um here in this class you're going to learn the process of of how to do that kind of research which so you will be laying the foundation for that type of research that will eventually lead you to to uh, um um getting a bachelor's degree a masters phd and so on okay so we see uh, several other questions can a class 12 student join this yes absolutely so students that have completed that will complete class 9 in summer of this year uh, they are eligible to apply uh, now it also depends on the students level but students that have completed class 10 or class 11 or are in currently in class 12 will benefit the most from this course we are recording the session and after the event we will upload the recording to our youtube channel and we'll circulate it to uh, all of you i mean all the participants who registered for the webinar so uh, if you missed a part of the event you can still see the recording so what are the different journals you'll be taking our research paper to so arnav we do not take uh, the research paper to various journals we publish the papers that are endorsed by the professors scholarly publishes it some of the students have taken those papers to other journals and as professor petters has mentioned some of them have been published by uh, other journals including the one linked to the cern mm -hmm. okay i think professor some questions for you time required for research and time needed to be put in by a student i'm sorry could you repeat i'm sorry i, I lost you there for a second Sure. Time required for research. Basically, they're asking for time commitment. How much oh. time do they have to spend on the project during the summer? Well, uh, it's it's up to the student. Um, and um, again, the the it's uh, we we have this rule of thumb that we say for each hour that you spend in the classroom, you should spend at least three hours uh, working outside the classroom. So so that's that's the typical rule uh, I will not violate that rule too much and um but because um, I I'm I'm pretty flexible I give students some um, enough flexibility to uh to finish their papers um and uh it's more important to me that the papers are done uh, properly 
rather than done quickly. Uh, so so you, you will have all of the time that you need. I will not put too much pressure and too many demands on your time. Professor, one question. Do you provi provide recommendations, testimonials at the end? Of course, I've already done that. Um, uh, for any student who asks for a recommendation, I'm always happy to provide that. And I've written many letters so far uh, for students who are applying to universities here. Uh, I wrote recommendation letters for them. Uh, so typically we'll have to wait until the course is over so that I can see the complete, uh, you know, complete work. And after that, I'm always happy to write letters uh, and send them directly to universities and, and, and other schools too. I, I've, sent, um, I've sent letters to a couple of places in India, I believe. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly where, but uh, there were for uh, recommendations that um, students needed for summer institutes or some type of, uh, of, of work that they wanted to do. Uh, so I did provide letters for them. Professor, if I may add to that, so we are also in touch with a number of students that uh, appear for the introduction to research and uh, I can add to this. So there's a question, uh, which universities have the students gone to? So some of the students that have worked uh, in science, especially computer science or physics, they've gone to Car uh, Carnegie Mellon, they've gone to uh, Caltech, they've also gone to Georgia Tech and Princeton. So uh, if you look at the whole, uh, width of the universities where the students have gone to, there's some very smart and bright students that have worked with Professor Perisis and uh, Allegheny College during the summers in past year. And uh, Professor, uh, some of your students from last year summer, you may not uh, be aware uh, about their placements yet, but we are. So some of your students have been extremely successful and I'm mm -hmm. sure in the next few days, you'll hear more from them when they mm -hmm. intimate you about their results. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I, some, I had some students who were incredibly bright and I have to, uh, I have to uh, reinforce that, that they uh, very well motivated students, uh, very bright, uh, hard workers. Uh, and, and I'm not surprised they get into very good schools. Okay, I think we are almost at the end of the hour. I don't see any unanswered questions at this time. Uh, we will be circulating a recording later on. And if there are any questions, we are pleased to answer that for the audience. Uh, Professor Pettisis, again, as always, it's a pleasure uh, welcoming you to this event. And this is, I, I must say, the physics webinar is one of the most exciting ones uh, that we conduct. All the webinars are good, but this one is especially exciting. And given that this is one of the first programs that we started with, this I think this is uh, really close to my heart. So thanks a lot for joining us today. And thank you to all the audience for uh, being here and for the great questions. Thank you, always a pleasure.